an awesome, awesome God. And really, it should be only reserved for Him, Him alone. You know, Vicki, I thought you were getting ready to preach my sermon when you started talking about home work and our house is in disarray and, and dust and everything is in every different direction. Uh, most of you know that the house has been torn apart and new kitchens going in and uh, new flooring. And, uh, so you can have great distractions uh, by things. And, uh, Yesterday I was officiating a wedding here and, uh, uh, at 3 o'clock and uh, I was so tired and uh, I usually have a, a, a manual that I follow for the vows and I kind of lost my place in it and uh, just started to mumble a little bit and uh, some individuals after the service said, boy, there were some wonderful vows there. And I'm thinking, that's only God's grace, God's grace. Uh, that's the title of the message today, Abundant Grace. We know about the grace that's given to us uh, through salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot save ourselves. Uh, only Christ took the brunt of humanity. The sin uh, of humanity was placed upon him. And through him we have forgiveness and we have new life. And that is the amazing grace that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God so loved the world that he gave his son. So whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have an, an eternal life that we might have a relationship with him. And he sent the spirit to dwell within us and here on the earth until he returns or takes us home. Uh, what a grace that is. And so I hope first and foremost you understand uh, salvation is through grace, not by works. At least any man shall boast. But the grace I'd like to talk about also is the abundant grace that we have every day. You see, some become saved and then they forget that they need the grace every day just to breathe in and breathe out. You know that, that a, a blade of grass cannot grow without the grace of God allowing it. And sometimes we tend to forget those things. But we forget that the dexterity of our hands or the strength in our body comes from the grace of God. Uh, my body was aching, and I said, God, help me, and our Lord is faithful. He upheld me with his righteous right hand. My back, many of you know I have a bad back, but God enabled me. He strengthened me, and he poured out grace for me abundantly, and I, therefore I am so thankful. Yes, I called to the Lord in the day of trouble when I was uh, dead in my sins and transgressions, and he forgave me because of his grace. Nothing I can do. It's an unmerited gift. He has given it to me. I just opened my hands and I received it. But I don't uh, reject that grace daily. I need that grace every moment of my life. And see, we learn in the scriptures. Uh, thank God, in the word of God, not everyone in here was perfect. Amen. As we start to see uh, the individuals and the characters that God used for his glory, by no way and no means were they perfect. But yet God bestowed grace on them that they were able and enabled them to do great exploits and feats beyond our imagination, beyond what we could even think. Why? Because they yielded to Almighty God. And one individual that we're going to be looking at today was the Apostle Paul. Yes, the Apostle Paul. He was a very educated man. He came from wealth. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And yet, in the end of his life, he said he counts all those things as rubbish compared to knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. And so we're going to follow a little bit in his life and parallel with our lives as we need that grace each day. Amen. So if you turn with me to 1 Timothy 1 Timothy in chapter 1. This passage of scripture means so much to me because it, it kind of parallels my life in some ways. It is only the grace of God that I am in a ministry today. It is only the grace of God that He appointed me. Me, the foolishness of this world. The Bible says, the shame, the lies. 
when I was dead in my transgressions, when I was far from the ways of God and I didn't even have the things of the mind of God in my heart, God drew me by His love and His mercy and His grace. And He appointed me to His service. Imagine that. Uh, being a minister and a pastor for the Almighty God was the farthest thing from my heart. My heart's desire was to follow my own ways. My heart's desire was uh, maybe to gather the wealth as uh, many of us did when we were dead in our transgressions, walking in darkness. Uh, we were selfish in our ways. We were bitter in our ways. We had our own agenda. But God's mercy turned all those things around. Hallelujah. And I am so glad. You see, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Uh, you could start out thinking you have the way, the path, and you're right in it, and find out that you're wrong in it. You know, I, I use the analogies of, of construction. We're, we're laying the floor over the house over there, and uh, I'm, I'm putting it down, and uh, I'm just following the walls that are there. Well, if you do that, you see, and the walls are not correctly straight, uh, at the end, you're going to have a big mess, you see. But I'm thinking that everything I'm doing is correct. But then you have those who have done things prior come along and straighten you out very quickly. This is the way. And it's kind of like that in our lives, you know. We rely on our own understanding. We think this is the way, you know. Uh, life is about getting a good job. Life is about getting educated. Uh, Raising a family, we think that that's all there is to it. But see, that is great, but that's only secondary. When you place God first, you find real life. You find true life. What is it a man that will gain this whole world and yet lose his soul, my friends? You see, God bestowed on us what the true life is, but that was given to us through his grace and through his mercy. All of you can think about at times you, you ended up in a path that uh, is taking you far off track, but God's mercy would show you the correct path again. And uh, He does that for me every day. I start out in one direction, but it is His grace and His mercy that redirects me and places me back where I need to be. If I yield to Him, you see, and when I yield to Him, He does do that. So turn with me in the text. We're going to look at the, the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was Saul at one time, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a persecutor of the church. He persecuted the newly found Christian church, believing that his way was right, believing that uh, the law was the only way for salvation, keeping it Thoughtlessly, he thought that salvation was found through that. And how many uh, can understand that we could not keep the law perfectly? God was giving us the law as a tutor to show us that we needed Jesus Christ, and that we needed grace. Uh, the law, if you would just lay it out, and you lay out the Ten Commandments, and you say, put yourself up on a measure line, could you have kept those Ten Commandments? Absolutely not. And if the wages of sin was death, guess what? We all deserve death. And if we could not keep the Ten Commandments, uh, per se, matter of fact, if you go through the scriptures, like 620 commandments. And guess what? We couldn't keep it. And that's why we have grace. That's why we have the Lord Jesus Christ that has forgiven us because of not being able to fulfill those commandments. But God through Jesus Christ, fulfilled them for us. Amen? Amen? Listen to what Jesus said. I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. You see, meaning that God laid out these laws, a man must live by them, he must obey them. If he doesn't obey them, he's not going to see the kingdom of God. We'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? So Jesus came, fulfilled the law for us, took the brunt of sin for us and allow us to enter into an eternal life, the forgiveness of sins, and therefore we're thankful. The Apostle Paul, when he was persecuting the church, 
He was he obtained letters from the high priest and he was going to a city in Damascus to go ahead and arrest some of the, uh, the Christians and bring them back and have them persecuted, put in jail and then murdered, uh, have them murdered. He met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And on that road, he saw a bright light and on that bright light, the Lord spoke to him. And this is what he said. He said, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, I want you to understand something. When he said, why do you persecute me? He was persecuting the church. Now, friend, if you persecute the church, you can't talk bad about the church because this is the church of the living God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say something bad about the church, you're saying it about Jesus. Jesus came right in defense of his church. Right? And so he said, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so Saul met the, the Lord Jesus Christ on Damascus Road. Uh, whether he was traveling by foot, whether he was traveling by mule, whether he was traveling by a horse that might be white. The reason I say that is, you know the term. He got knocked off his high horse. <laughs> he met the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And his life changed and transformed from him. A persecutor of the church. One who had hatred for the very uh, kingdom of God. Because he believed that Christianity was the wrong way. Why do I say that? Because there are those who think that they have the right way and yet are way off course. Kind of like laying that floor. Kind of like going and continuing uh, on my own path without looking and relying on the one who could direct me correctly. So follow me now in 1 Timothy in the first chapter. I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. And listen to this. It says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for he had counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Here is a Pharisee, here who won for an evilistic, here who won, one who has, uh, knew the law of God, he taught the law of God. Now he is saying that it is Christ Jesus, the one who has met on the Damascus road, has enabled him. Now, that is a great point. I want you to understand that the dexterity in your hands, the breath that you breathe, the blade of grass that grows is by the grace of God. He's the one who enables us. Amen. He's the one who enables us to do anything. You see? And therefore, we're thankful. And that's how the Apostle Paul had this attitude of gratitude and lived out the remainder of his life. Remind you that... Uh, this was probably written about A.D. 62 uh, after he was released in his first imprisonment. Timothy, his protege or apprentice, however you want to say, his beloved son uh, was there in Ephesus where this letter has been sent to him. It's a pastoral letter. The Apostle Paul had given his entire life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he counted everything that he thought was worth anything uh, for the sake of knowing who Jesus is. And so he's returning thanks in just that statement. It is he who has enabled me, and he counted me faithful in putting me into the ministry. See, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ does not come from seminary. It does not come from church appointment. It comes from God himself. Uh, a minister is appointed from God. Otherwise, you have someone who is just leaning on their own understanding. And friends, I know that because of the least of these of ministers, I am. And I trust God weekly that He gives me what is needed for our church. And believe me, I oscillate back and forth at times. What is of me and what is of God? There's a great struggle in that as being a, uh, a pastor. I'll tell you, I have a whole file, a computer loaded of sermons that I could bring every week.
But that might not be what God wants, right? We have to, it is God who enables me. It is God who gives me the word that we believe in season what we need. Amen? The, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's to dividing the soul and the spirit, the joints and marrow, and, and it searches the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. When God's word is spoken, it is speaking to your heart, you see. Because we, we need our hearts to be transformed and changed. And so the word of God goes forward, and knowing that it's been uh, only him that enables us. And look what he says here in verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and an injurious, a violent man? The Apostle Paul, he was a violent man, injurious. He, he pronounced violence on others. He hurt people. Now think of your life prior to Christ. You see, I hope and pray that you're a new creation. You, you don't do the things you used to do because the things that I used to do... Uh, we would put pressure on people uh, without even understanding what we were doing because we were led by our flesh. You see, we were led by our own wisdom. We were led by our own reasoning. And we were led by our own sinful desires. And guess what? You're an injurious, you're hurt people when you do that. Can you say amen to that? If you remember where your life was and, and when you followed your flesh and when you were just a... You know, you didn't love God. I didn't love God. I love myself. You see, separate from God, I love myself. And then when Christ came in my life, that was grace. He poured out on me, and this is what you'll see. And see, uh, that's why the Apostle Paul is so uh, ecstatic about the grace that has been poured upon him that he lived out the remainder of his life preaching the gospel. That's why he could, as uh, Vicky was saying, he's in a, uh, in a Roman prison and writing to the church of Philippi, you know, do everything without arguing or complaining. He's in prison. He's in Roman chains and he's writing these things. He said, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, you know, uh, how could you say those things when, uh, unless God is pouring on you grace? Amen? So, Look what he says in verse 13 again. Who was before a, a blasphemer and a persecutor and an injurious. But he says, I obtained mercy because I did it uh, ignorantly and unbelief. He did not believe he could. He was uh, ignorant into the things of God and God bestowed on him mercy. I think each one here can understand that. When we were led by our own ways, doing our own sinful desires, it, we were not doing that intentionally. We thought that things, the way we were, was right. And that's why I say there is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. You see? Only God's ways are right. And it's only God's mercy when He makes it known to you. And I hope and pray that He has made it known to you. See, the Apostle Paul saw a bright light. Who did he see? Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and, and whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And when Jesus comes into your life, he sheds all that darkness away, and then you can see clearly. And then you have his word to follow, because his word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And you have that word every day that you put open, and you find direction, and you find peace, and you find grace through it. It's his mercy. Do you know, the, you know the difference between mercy and you know the difference between grace, right? Grace is an unmerited gift that's given to you that you did not earn. You go to work this week and you reap, uh, reap a salary, you earn that salary, right? But grace is different. You don't go to work, but yet you get a salary. You have been given something that you did not earn. Mercy is something that's withheld from you that you do deserve. See, the Apostle Paul understands that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned and we all deserve death and separated from the love of God. But he bestowed mercy on us. That means he withheld the punishment that we all deserve. I don't know about you, that just makes me happy because if I got what I deserve, 
If I got what I deserve, that's why I have great joy in my heart when I understand that. Amen. When I understand that God withheld what I really deserve. How can I not be thankful? And friend, I have to tell you, when you recognize that, you're able to see mercy withheld in others' lives. And what I mean by that, you know we're hard on others than we are on ourselves. We become critical and judgmental on others and we think that they should do this or might do that. And I think we all fall prey with that, uh, maybe to the clerk at the store or the clerk down at the coffee shop that didn't make your coffee right. We don't bestow grace on them. We kind of want to bestow what? <laughs> Judgment, right? Come on now. Isn't it true? We, God freely given us grace and mercy. Why don't we extend the grace and mercy that he has given us? That's why it's so important we understand what it is. Because if we got what we deserve, what right do we have? To pronounce judgment on someone else. They don't deserve that. So that's just a little tidbit. And that's for me. Because I'm quick to fall in that category at times. To point out someone else's fault. They should be doing that. But you know what? If I extend grace, I extend mercy. Do you know that love covers over a multitude of sins? talking to an individual yesterday that had trouble with his child and he sensed to stand the course and stay by him and just love him and others would try to give direction on how things should do, you know, how you should correct your children and so on. And the individual said, no, I'm just going to love them and stay. And you know what? They come out the other side, amen? Covering over a multitude of sin. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to bring right correction or train a child up in the way they should go and in the end they shall repent. I'm not saying that. But we need to recognize that they deserve mercy also. And the grace that God has freely given to us. And uh, that there is so much and the Apostle Paul understood that. So he's saying here, I was once a persecutor. I was a, a, a blasphemer. He blasphemed God, right? He did this. And then in verse 14, he says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. You know what that says there? It was poured out on him abundantly. God's grace was poured out on him abundantly. Wonderfully. Here he was persecuting the church of the living God. And God just poured out the grace on him abundantly. And therefore, he responded to it. And we don't have time, but I want you to look this up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. And the Apostle Paul says this, I am what I am. That was not Popeye. <laughs> he says, I am what I am. He says, it is the grace of God was to me without an effect. Meaning, it was effectual. When God's grace was poured on him, it affected him. So, it changed his life. Because he understood what it was. And it says it wasn't without any effect. It brought him to the person of who he is. So again, 14, he says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which what is in Christ Jesus. Do you know that we can't love truly unless you have God in you? <laughs> Do you know you really don't have any faith unless the faith was put there? God says He gives us the measure of faith. He is the one who draws us. He is the one that places that within us. And He says that the grace and the love that was in Christ Jesus, now we're able to love as we ought to love. Now we're able to believe as we ought to believe. That's nothing of our own. It's by grace. It's been given to us. So if you think for a moment that where you are today and where you're at, that you've got yourself here, we're wrong. No. God has brought you to this very position in life where you're at right now. And through our cooperation with Him, we grow in grace. 
from grace to grace to grace. As we yield to him, we continue to grow. So he says it was poured out on him abundantly. And then verse 15 says, if this is a faithful saying, I want you to see this, and worthy of all acceptation, except this, he's saying, that Christ Jesus came into the world, look at this, to save sinners of whom I am what? Chief. Do you see what that says there? That's in the present tense, my friend. That's not a past tense. That's a present tense. Who I am chief sinners, he says. Do you think Apostle Paul had it perfect after he was saved? That's why he says, I do what I do not want to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, it is not I who do it, but sin that is in me that does it. He knew that he needed the measure of grace every day. We need grace every day. And he says, I was past tense chief sinner? No, present tense chief sinner. He understands who he is. He says, there's nothing good that lives within me that is in my flesh, that is in my sinful nature. And you can find that in Romans 7, verse 18 and 19. He said, nothing good lives within me that is in my sinful nature. But glory to God when Christ is in me. He says, now it is I who no longer live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Amen. My life is no longer my own. He saved me by grace. He bestowed mercy, withheld the penalty, and now I live for him and him alone. How would you? Because guess what? My life doesn't belong to me. I've been bought with a price by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad? Yes. Aren't you glad you've been redeemed from death to life? From death to life. From darkness to light. Hallelujah. That's what the church is about. Blessed are the redeemed. Let the redeemed say so. What the Lord has done. Amen. Look what the Lord has done. Look at you, brothers and sisters, hallelujah, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, we've been brought into the family of God. Why? Because of God's grace and His mercy. Romans 5, 8 says this, He demonstrated His love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad there's new beginnings? Aren't you glad that you can be a new creation and the old is past and the new has come? Aren't you glad that love covers over all sins and God says that love keeps no record of wrong? Glory to God. God doesn't have a file that he pulls out every time you mess up and say, oh yeah, back in 1988, look at you did. Aren't you glad that you've been covered by the blood of Christ? You see, the righteousness we have is not our own righteousness. It's His righteousness, Jesus Christ. See, God made Him sin. Who knew no sin? He was perfect. So that through Him, we might become the righteousness in God. We're free from the old and brought into the new. See, that should make you elated. So he says here again, it was abundant. The faithful saying of this is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Why is that, that point important? Do you think that we can drift from thinking that we don't need God every day? Can you think we can get to a place where we think that uh, I can handle this on my own? Uh, I thank you for my salvation, but I got it. Come, sometimes we're like that in our prayer life. I know you're busy, so I'll handle it. You know, has anybody ever been there? You know, that's wrong. You have to rely on Him all the time in all the ways. And understand, if it depends on you and your flesh, we're in trouble. Because this flesh 
and it's going to lead you from the ways of God. The flesh and your spirit are in enmity in one another. The Bible declares it. It lays it out for us. There's a battle that goes on. And without the grace of God, we're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably. And you'll be flat on your face. And guess what? It's okay to be on your face. Why? Because God uses that when you're on your face. The Apostle Paul, he was given great revelation. He was taken up to the third heaven. He's seen things that were not able for man to see. And you read this in 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. So he was taken up and it said this. Then he was given a thorn in his flesh to buffet him. A thorn from Satan. Why? Because of the great revelations given unto him, so he would not become too proud. So he says this, and you can look this up in 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, and verses 9 and 10 there, he says that, out of my great weakness, Christ's power was made perfect. Out of my weakness, I have been made strong. You see, my friends, it's not of our own merit, it's not of our own strength, it's out of your weakness that Christ's power is seen. I, I come here today tired, bewildered, overcome with all the things that are going on. But I yield it to Him. And it is the power of God that raised me up and enabled me to speak this 40 minutes. And friends, I, I feel like I could go another 40. And this is only the grace of God. <laughs> I'm sure some are here saying no. Close it, brother, close it. I'll just read the last of it and we'll close. And he says, How about for this cause did I obtain mercy, that in me the first Jesus Christ might show forth long suffering for a pattern of them that should afterward believe on him to life everlasting. Now to the King eternal, immoral, invisible, the only wise God, be honored glory forever and ever. Amen. I want you to study that verse 16, talking about it is God's patience with you, uh, unlimited patience that He showed in our lives, that others may come unto glory because of the goodness in your own life. But a word of, a word of uh, warning, God has unlimited patience, but don't try. Mm -hmm. Father, we close. We close with your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of those who have gone before us. We thank you, Lord, that the men and women in the scriptures, uh, they were not perfect, but with you in them, Father, uh, you show us, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for us. That the, your power is made perfect in our yieldness and weakness. Thank you, Father. Bless each one here today. I pray, Lord, that as the word went forward, I pray that there was understanding. I pray, God, that it would settle upon their hearts. And, Father, if there's questions, I pray they would ask you. And you would, Father, give them the answers to their questions. And I pray this in Jesus' name.